Hello and welcome to the CDW Canada Tech Talks podcast. I'm your host, KJ Burke, Field CTO for Hybrid Infrastructure at CDW Canada. And today we're going to talk to Ramin Rowan. He is the Corporate Vice President of AI Product Management at AMD. And Gerardo Amaya. Uh, Gerardo is the uh, Senior Industry and Tech Leader uh, for Global Advisories at Microsoft. Uh, thank you for joining us. And, uh, okay. and Ramin, if you could maybe uh, uh, talk about yourself and, and your background a little bit so we can understand you know, your history and, and, uh, and what you do at AMD currently. Sure. So my team manages uh, the software and some of the hardware for AI at AMD. Mm -hmm. We're part of a new group called um, the AI group at AMD. And uh, myself, I come from the Xilinx acquisition. AMD uh, bought uh, Xilinx a couple of years ago. And uh, we had a pretty uh, good AI team already there. We had done a few acquisitions. And uh, we were basically accelerating AI on our FPGAs that uh, power different devices at the endpoint and uh, at the edge. Uh, and that's how we ended up uh, creating an AI group after the acquisition at AMD. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, and seeing that you've, you've you know, changed organizations, but, but really, uh, are, are you focused in the same, in the same areas? Or, or has, your, has your role changed as well? So um, Xilinx uh, mostly does chips, SOCs, that uh, end up in uh, endpoint cameras, for example, or edge devices, which could be uh, computers at the edge or, or literally cars, mm -hmm. which are filled with endpoint sensors. And uh, since 2016 or so, our customers started to ask us to accelerate AI. Uh, obviously, with autonomous driving and ADAS before that, uh, or smart city, smart retail, uh, th there is a lot of need for AI acceleration. So we came with that background, and the, the, the software for that is also very similar to what you see today for data center. But what uh, happened after the acquisition is that we expanded that to the data center because AMD is very strong in servers and data center GPUs. Uh, so it's similar, but we actually expanded the role. So now we cover everything from the endpoint to the edge to the big iron server GPUs in the cloud. Oh, that's, that's awesome. And, uh, and so some really looking forward to, to that. And then thank you for traveling in for that. We really appreciate that as well. Thank you. Um, and, and then Gerardo, if you could talk about you know your role at Microsoft and, and kind of what your team focuses in on. Uh, absolutely, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. Uh, my team focuses on the what we call the partner side of the organization. So we focus on helping companies uh, leverage our technology, adopt the technology with our customers. Uh, so my coverage is across the Americas. So I have a team deployed across the continent, helping partners in the enablement and in in this AI moment. Uh, the biggest priority since last January has been the adoption of AI, our technologies, and cementing Microsoft as the go-to partner uh, with partners like CDW or and even with AMD in different categories. So that's that's the main objective of the the work we do every day, being the tech advisor for for our customers and partners. Yeah, and, and I think it's 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 interesting that, that you know we we're talking earlier about sort of the marriage of the hardware and the software, and then also the platforms and and. And the you know the, like the full stack sort of capabilities of, of providing AI and, and so so I wanted to start a little bit with the hardware ecosystem and 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 we can kind of build on on that and one of the things I've been really impressed with is I've been testing out um, you know some of the the technology that has the the neural processing units sort of built into it and uh, I've been really surprised at the performance and the and the and you know the responsiveness of those technologies, uh, even in a small form factor like a laptop. And and so you know if, maybe we could talk mm -hmm. a little bit about you know NPUs. I think originally we're, it was an IPU. We're talking inferencing processing unit, but I guess neural the marketing guys got to it. So now it's a neural processing unit. That's but right. but how? Um, and, and I know you're you're uniquely qualified to talk about this because of your role at Xilinx. But but how? Um, you know, how does the NPU sort of change the way that we, we, we work at the endpoint, um, at the edge of our, our networks uh, with AI? Yeah, that's a good question. Basically, um, there are different requirements, uh, whether you're talking about uh, endpoints, the, the, the edge, or the mm -hmm. cloud. Um, 
the AI requirements are very different in that in the data center, in the cloud, you really want a lot of compute power. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to uh, train things like ChatGPT, right? That's an awful lot of compute power. Um, performance per watt is important, but really the compute power is the most important. For laptops and PUs, really what matters is battery life. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you're building an NPU because you want a lot of compute power, but you don't want to drain the battery, right? So you, you're going to have still a GPU for graphic rendering, 3D gaming, and so on. But using that for AI, first of all, there's not going to be enough power to do end gaming and mm -hmm. uh, AI acceleration at the same time. Um, so, and, uh, and using the CPU is not going to give you enough compute power. And again, it's going to drain the, the battery. So you need to have a specialized hardware to do AI at low power and GPU for gaming and, uh, and the CPU. And then when you go uh, at the endpoints, like for smart cameras and automotive, what's really important there is latency. Uh, because mm. like, if your self-driving car is uh, seeing an obstacle, like a kid playing on the road, it, you want it to hit the brake as soon as possible. And latency is not as important in the data center or in laptop, but it's extremely critical there. And then uh, when you look at that, you realize that you actually need three different types of architecture. One that that's caters to very high compute power, one that caters to low battery life, uh, high battery life, uh, low, low power, and the other one that uh, is extremely responsive. So we basically created those uh, three different architecture and deployed them in, in the different domains. Yeah, and, and what's, what I find interesting with that is, is we've, you know, for, for decades, the CPU was kind of a general purpose tool. And, and then, you know, with, with uh, really, you know, what we were doing with the GPUs and doing, um, you know, uh, really multi-threaded process across thousands of smaller cores as opposed to these serial processes, it, it's it's interesting to see that um, you know teams like yourself and 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 the team at, at Xilinx and, and AMD uh, coming up with uh, another specialized tool to sort of add to the toolbox to to really optimize that and and not only mm -hmm. would the battery life be terrible but if you had the laptop on your lap you'd leave light on fire you would burn it would it'd be way <laughs> too warm so so um, so Gerardo um, you know. We're, we're talking about the hardware, but but and and I know this is also one of the uh, the big things that um, you know, uh, Ramin, you and the team are doing is is it's it's really how do we create the software layer that's managing the hardware more effectively? And and so, you know, having these tools available, how are you seeing you know software development and 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 some of the things we're layering on top of this hardware change, um, you know, with with these new tools being available. Absolutely, and I'll preface the change by saying there's a lot of parallels in what what we were just uh, showing around hardware, right? That the same modula modularity is needed. Um, it's so interesting. We started with the Big Bang with the the big GPT model, and really that created a bit of the the big revolution in generative AI. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we started seeing all the parallels. Like there's use cases that require less of the capability. So can we use that? That's where you see a lot of push now with small language models and that can run locally or even can run in the cloud with less consumption. So what we're seeing now is in a quick evolution, the ability to harness the big models for the big use cases or the ability to narrow down to a specific cases as well. So I think it goes side by side in the parallel, the ability for a developer to test something on their laptop really quickly, validate a few things, then test it at a higher scale in cloud, or at the same time, if the use case just requires, uh, just as you mentioned, quick response, quick answers to certain things, like a validation of a yes or no sentiment analysis, we don't need to really uh, <clears throat> leverage the big model. We, we can leverage it specifically. And, and last but not least, we are creating a, a convergence of all AI together. ML is becoming better because of generative AI. And together, we can find paths where if you see it as a flow, of requirements for intelligence, we can identify where do we place the right piece of platform or software, the same as we think of hardware. Yeah, and uh, the, the other thing we were talking about a little bit earlier was, was really that, um, 
many of the techniques that we're using to advance uh, what we're doing with AI are now being applied at the hardware layer. We're now applying those to you know the way that we're developing software. Like and and so the tools themselves are now uh, making it possible to make better chips. And 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 so um, so how is how is AI and some of the new tools that are being uh, created in that space uh, driving a change in how we're we're, we're developing hardware? Or, or maybe some of the techniques that we're doing uh, when, when we look at the data center, we look at these large cloud platforms. Yeah, I, actually, my background before I uh, worked at Xilinx and uh, on AI is in EDA, in electronic design automation, which is precisely the software, the software that is used to build uh, mm -hmm. chips. So um, the EDA industry actually is going through a revolution using uh, AI for algorithm. One specificity of EDA algorithm, basically to build chips that have billions of transistors from a high-level description language, is that uh, all the algorithms there are exponentially hard. Uh, they're, mm. they're optimization algorithms that are almost impossible to solve. And we don't solve them, but we find solutions that are close enough to the optimal solution. And those are the prime algorithms that uh, AI can actually do better than traditional software programming. Uh, so the EDA industry is going through that revolution right now where AI is improving the algorithm, which allows chip designers like AMD to make better chips to power AI that will again improve EDA. So you, you're in this virtual cycle right now of AI improving chip design and manufacturing and chips improving those algorithms. And, and, and that's really exciting too. And then, and then even, because uh, we, I mean, as, as, as technology people, we think of the chips and we think of the, you know, the silicone and that as, as kind of the bottom layer. But, um, you know, was at a, a talk the other day and there were some University of Toronto people talking and, and they're actually looking at AI to help them discover you know, uh, uh, new types of plastics, new types of materials that conduct better. And, and so even the, the physical components that we're using may be affected by uh, some of these AI tools and our ability to, to do better discovery. Uh, uh, absolutely. In general, when you're dealing with scientific computing problems that are extremely hard to solve, like you're trying to find one solution out of trillions of trillions of trillions of solutions, that's where AI uh, does the best. And so a lot of different scientific computing, like material mm -hmm. science and uh, genomics and so on, is uh, being solved by AI. Even playing Go and chess, right? Yeah. And, and what is interesting about that is I, I, we see it also as the evolution, like a language evolution. So it's understanding now natural language mm -hmm. is a big revolution. But as we get closer in this type of scenarios with understanding language of science, understanding language of nature, that is really when we see the exponential growth that we're seeing and it's already paying dividends. Yeah, and the other thing I find really interesting with that is, um, you know, just because of the way that AI functions, uh, it's not necessarily coming at the problem like, like humans do. And, and so, um, you know, one of the conversations that I, that I have around uh, AI with the customers I talk to is it's, it's really taking a lot of the same data sets and potentially finding new insights there that, that you yourselves with your background or my personal biases, all the things that I bring to the table, um, it's, it's having a, 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 a different set of eyes from a brain that really thinks in a different way and, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I find that to be really, really interesting um, as well when you're talking about trying to solve some of those, those challenges or, or, or get closer to perfect. Yeah, right? that, that, that's absolutely correct. I mean, when you think about it, our brain is a neural network and it went through millions of years of evolution. <laughs> we, we had to find food, hunt and uh, escape from predators. So we got wired a certain way and the artificial neural network that we're creating are wired a different way. So they do think completely differently and uh, they learn from the data, but they, they apply different biases. They're, they're not really general intelligence. They still specialize like we are, but they're specialized in a different way. And you can see it when you look at uh, AlphaZero playing chess, for example. It, 
it doesn't play like a human does. Yeah. It, it really doesn't. It sacrifices a lot of things early on and you think, okay, the, this thing <laughs> is really bad. And at the end, you, it finds a, a very quick checkmate and you, you, humans don't really understand why it's playing the way it is. And an important message around that is the way we see the pattern of adoption is we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. Right now with the AI as we, as we use it today, we interact and we query the AI, we get some, some additional responses, but we see the next phase of that evolution, what we like to call core reasoning. So it's not only we ask and we get a different perspective, but imagine the two machines, the human machine and the AI core reasoning together, mm -hmm. getting to a different perspective. That, that is the next frontier, which is closer than we think, but it's, it's the evolution how the technology is, is evolving. Yeah, and, and uh, the co-reasoning, uh, I think when we were talking, that was the first time I'd heard that, and I, that, that's, that's fascinating. And, and um, so sort of in that frame of mind, maybe what we can talk about is, is some of the use cases we're seeing in the industry. So, I mean, you already mentioned, you know, uh, um, automated driving and, and, and things like that. I know, um, you know, again, my, my background's mining. I, I know automated equipment. Um, just to create a, a, a you know better safety, you, know, you don't have people that are necessarily in those environments, um, and and so uh, you know AI is is transforming some of these use cases. And so one of the things we were talking about was with health healthcare. Um, and so so when you look at something like healthcare, we talked about space exploration. You know what are some of the use cases, Gerardo, that that you you look at and and they're really compelling, they're really exciting as as to what what you're starting to see. Um, Knowing that this is we're we're this is you know we're at the infancy we're 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 in the crawl stage so so what are the things you're seeing that are really exciting you? So I, I think for in, in two different dimensions I'll give you the two edges of the of the, of the trends that we see. So basically at the, at the bottom or let's say at the on the on the first side we are seeing an increase in productivity meaning focusing uh, health professionals to focus on the very thing they do well which is health. And allowing the technology, not to, not for the, the health professional to be interacting with the technology while doing health, but now the ability to just do health and the technology will be around to really complement with solutions, with uh, like, a, like as simple as it sounds, the ability for the doctor to really talk to the patient. Mm -hmm. And in the back end, the technology just doing prescription compliance, management, acknowledgement of different things. That is really a key, key example of a very simple productivity enhancement. And then we go to the other spectrum when we are thinking about new medication, new, new type of treatment ideas on how do we better address certain vaccines like we are seeing the entire spectrum being executed which sometimes is overwhelming and exciting I tell my customers if you feel those two things at the same time it's the right path but it's it's the possibilities of executing on all that we're seeing that is that is very promising yeah and so Ramin when you think yeah. about what are the things that are exciting you yeah so some of the application we're enabling with AI with our customers are really exciting actually for healthcare. Um, the stories I, I like the most, uh, Illumina uh, is using our technology for genome analytics and they deploy that in children hospitals uh, where children, babies can born sick and you basically have a few hours or a few days to root cause the problem so you can treat it. So they do a quick genome sequencing and then they have to analyze it to, to see what are the, the diseases that the, the, the baby may have. And they basically, uh, with our technology, accelerate that analytics from a day and a half to 10 minutes. So it literally saves yeah. baby's life. And then uh, the protein folding problem has been solved also. So AI uh, is used for new drug discoveries. And then you have uh, surgical robots that can uh, perform surgery uh, uh, either on their own, but uh, it's usually assisted by a surgeon that can be remote. Like if you have an expert in Europe, they can perform surgery in the US or in Africa uh, with that technology. Yeah, it, it, both of those, like all of those are really interesting use cases. I think um, to, to the point you made earlier, which was really around, 
you know, how do we uh, provide the, the real-time analytics, the real-time power of, of, those, um, you know, of those models and those algorithms? And, and, and yeah, shortening up multiple days into 10 minutes. Obviously, that's, that's, that's huge when you talk about healthcare. Um, so so as, we're, as we're looking at the use cases, I mean, one, one of the, you know, the big changes to um, you know, how we work with, with uh, uh, AI and how we view AI was really sort of general language models. We said, okay, great, like this, this is open it up. It's, it's you know, what I, what I tell people um, is, uh, you know, language models and chatbots, it, it really made uh, AI accessible to everybody and it also made AI valuable to everybody. And, and so, but, but, but part of what we've been talking about um, both now and then before when we were, we were chatting was, was really that um, there's a pivot back to more specialized use cases. So we, we took the language model, now we've created almost a, a, a modern way of interfacing with, with, you know, the, with what we want to do. Um, but now we're really focusing more targeted with some of those use cases again. And, and so, so I think, you know, um, at, when you see the, the pivot from, you know, uh, uh, narrow AI, machine learning for, you know, targeted function, and then we have a, a, really an innovation, uh, you know, like, like language models and make it accessible and, and make it generalized. Now we're pivoting back to, to specialize. Is, is, is this similar to like that cyclical process where, we're just going to keep going, and, and we're going to find ways to make it more accessible. And we're going to narrow it down. Do you do you see that happening? Or yeah, yeah, we we definitely see the narrowing down happening because mm -hmm. uh, if if you have a general language model, uh, it's actually really expensive to run for okay. specific use cases. So uh, different companies are basically going to use smaller, more specialized language models for just their need. For example, if you want a chatbot for customer support for a specific product, you don't need the big uh, general language model. You're going to specialize it. But just one thing I want to say is that uh, even the biggest language model is actually not a general AI. It's not it's a good point. general artificial intelligence. It's very specialized to human language only. And when you think about it, when uh, a kid learns, uh, when he's one, two, three, four, five years old, he doesn't necessarily learn by reading and writing, right? Uh, they, they learn by observing the world. Uh, and that's not something a chatbot can do. Uh, so like understanding the laws of physics is not something a chatbot has inherently. So uh, there will be a lot more general models that we learn from, from seeing, from video, from, from hearing, from smelling, from interacting with people, just like humans do, just like babies do. So uh, I just want to make the point that what you're seeing right now, language model, is actually very specialized, even chat GPT, yeah. to, to human language, which which is not the way we evolved to, to learn ourselves. And, uh, no, I think it's a, it's a great compliment. What, what I'm thinking also from the general perspective, what a GPT model, chat GPT brought to, to people was the, I think in this first general scenario, it builds trust. It builds the trust of knowing the interaction and what it, what it brings you back. But, but really to the point, as we start getting more used to the technology, uh, we heard many times that they're saying, oh, the model is getting, is getting, uh, is, is decreasing performance, it's not working well. But in reality is we are demanding a more specialized experience, which is kind of the next step. And it's just similar to humans contextual, contextualizing the scenario, right? It's the analogy of talking to a general doctor versus a specialist. You get a perspective with the general concept and then you go to the narrow case. And we're identifying what's the perfect balance or the perfect flow between those scenarios. But, uh, but I think the key factor would be trust. ChatGPT gave us that, the, the trust to ask questions and get some responses, of course, tailoring it and adapting it to our needs. But, uh, but that, that is what we are in this back and forth of seeing the general, going to the specific. And as you mentioned, we'll find the technologies that support the specific and it will get better and better. And, and, and that, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting point. I, I hadn't really considered, um, I think we think of it as, uh, I think of it as being, you know, 
uh, very general. It, it, just because it's it's such a big innovation from where we were, you know, in a public sense, you know, a year ago, right? And, and so, but you're right, like it, it's got a long ways to go. And 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 I and I also think the point you make around adding additional senses um, and and what that does to to a, a, a you know the ability to understand the world, to provide feedback to the world, to answer questions. Uh, that's that's yeah, that's pretty interesting. That's right. Just think about it this way: if you put ChatGPT in a robot, and we know how to build robots, mm -hmm. um, can the robot learn how to drive? If you sit beside him in a car and 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 teach him, or can the robot play basketball or hockey or uh, be a helper at home? Um, it can't, right? Uh, yeah. So so there is a a lot more not evolution, but really re revolutionary improvement needed in AI to, to, to get there. And I think Sora, which just came out a few days ago, is the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. It's basically a multi-model uh, AI model that can, that can learn from seeing and hearing and, and, and also reading and writing. So uh, there is a lot more technological improvement needed, but that's the general direction. We need AI that can learn from all senses. And, and that's a good point. I mean, one of the things I, I uh, learned about a bit at uh, uh, HIMSS last year, uh, a healthcare conference, um, was, was the idea of the artificial nose and, and being able to, again, gather data that, that is, is uh, more, I guess, olfactory in, 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 in its, its basis. And then, again, being able to, to, to learn from that, like distill that down. And, 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 and what they were talking about was being able to um, analyze that information and detect if somebody was getting sick, just be, by seeing the differences between from one day to the next to the next and having a, a, you know, a, a kind of a database of, of what's normal. And then and when it deviates, being able to... So, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's, it's exciting, it's daunting. It'll probably cause, you know, like when we talk about the need for uh, uh, like large levels of compute in the cloud or in the data center, uh, cloud, you know, platforms for operating AI and creating these models. I just think about, I mean, we're just dealing with, with text at, at the moment. The moment we start adding mm -hmm. computer vision, we start adding all of the, the, the sights and the sounds and the smells, I, I just imagine these models are going to explode in, in size and, and, uh, and everything. Yeah, and this is absolutely going to happen. And when you think about it, what a nose does is to analyze the molecules that are in the air, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that you can easily do with uh, sensors and uh, computes, artificial intelligence. And I'll just add to that, yeah, probably the, the nose is still, the process of translating that to, to data is really the challenge, but the what we call the multimodal AI is already happening. Computer vision with uh, with Azure or with any cloud, it's it's already happening. Transcribing audio, converting to text, converting back to audio, doing multi-language translation. Really, all those capabilities are happening right now, and we're already experiencing multimodal experiences. It's just how the rest of the technology will start bringing more inputs and more contextualization to the case we want to solve. Okay, so so, we're, so I'm going to pivot now. So we're going to pivot to some of the challenges that we're seeing because uh, I, I think we you know, we've talked about the opportunity. We've talked about the the innovations that are being done at the hardware layer, at the cloud platform layer to support all, all of these um, you know these these innovations with AI. Um, you know, but we're also seeing challenges with you know skills. Uh, it's it's hard to find people. It's it's hard to to. Um, you know, uh, we were talking earlier, uh, uh, Gerardo, you and I, about change management. Getting people to sort of adopt to the new paradigm can be really challenging as well. And so, um, you know, what are you seeing in regards to skills and available skills? Um, are there, you know, if somebody is, is maybe, uh, you know, earlier in their career, they're flexible in, in learning, like what are some of the skills that are, are needed that, that maybe we're just having trouble finding? So just uh, being able to program AI systems. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th throughout my career, I saw software evolve. I, I, when I started to study software, we had to write everything from scratch. The, the data structures, the algorithm, there was no library. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later or a decade later, uh, GNU came up and now you had 
data structures and algorithm that were available in the open source. And people who didn't adapt to that uh, basically lost their jobs. They, they had to adapt to be able to, to use open source, to use the, the, the libraries and the data structure. And then later on, uh, native cloud native uh, programming came up, where now you have to be able to use uh, literally applications that are available uh, on the cloud and put them together. And then later AI came up. And uh, now it's not programming anymore. It's uh, AI programming, which is slightly different. But you, you do need to adapt to that. So we always say that AI is going to replace workers. Um, I think what's happening is that new technologies like AI are going to replace worker, but with other workers. Basically, w people who are not fast enough to adopt AI are going to be replaced by people who are adopting mm -hmm. AI. And uh, so, so if I have an advice to, to, to give people is get into it and try to adopt it as soon as possible. And if I may add, getting into it in your profession. We always say whatever your profession is, let's say if it's a lawyer, don't fear the AI. Fear the lawyer that master AI. And that, that will be the person that will challenge the, the status quo of the industry of the function. Uh, but there is an opportunity for anyone early in career. Now it's never been easier to learn, never been easier to take it to the next step. Even as, as we learn the new, the new AI models and what's happening, it's so easy to use AI as your assistant to learn faster, to test, to experiment. So this is, for me, the, the, one of the greatest times to be, to really, it's just the commitment and to your point, the, the will, the change management to, to, to really learn. And I, I think anyone can catch up and it's more democratized than ever. Yeah, that's it's a good point, and and it's uh, and it's also globally more democratized. Like it's like the accessibility to to these tools, and 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 I, I you know, Ramin, I agree with the, the point that you made around um, the shift in in what the skill sets that are required. And, and we think about it, um, you know, I, I and I didn't invent this, but but I, I've heard it used. Really, computers you used to have to you know program at a very low level. Then you could then you you had libraries that sat on top of that. Now you can really program in the human language. Like you can, you can, you can That's really, nice. you know, say what you want the output to be. And and I still think there's, I still think there's a lot of value in specialized skill sets. Obviously, you know, the, the people that are really trailblazing is is you know they're they're driving things in a way that that you know maybe AI isn't able to do, you know, at this point. But um, the other challenge that we really talk about, not not just from a skills and availability and 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 being able to help your teams grow and manage and change. It is also around uh, like data governance, data management, reducing the risk in your data sets. Um, when, when, you know, uh, Gerardo, when, when you look at um, helping organizations deploy some of these AI tools, um, how are you seeing them take on this, this data governance, data management uh, challenge? Absolutely. I think the, the one thing that is still consistent, even before the technology like generative AI or any other AI was, uh, was adopted mainstream, the, the data problem, garbage in, garbage out, still holds. And it's more urgent than ever because now models could take the, the wrong context from data and give you a very compelling answer <laughs> about something, right? It, and very confidently, you'll say, oh, this looks very, very legitimate. Uh, so I think from a quality perspective, it's never been more important. From a governance perspective, from a management understanding what are the boundaries of data? Who should have access to the data? That is now more important than ever, and I think the it's a priority. Of course, the we we are. I, I think generative AI and these new technologies show us the value realization mm -hmm. part of it. We need to work and really address those data quality, data management, and data governance. So even if you haven't adopted technology, if today your data is not is easily accessible, is not clean. That is still something that you need to address, regardless of the advancement of, of AI. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, curated data mm -hmm. directly affects the quality of your model. You can have a model that's orders of magnitude smaller than another one, but significantly better because it got trained with curated data. You can train an AI model with the entire internet. 
you're just going to get something that's really rude and full of fake <laughs> news, right? So you have to have really well curated data. And then for programmers, for something like uh, Microsoft Copilot, it's important also to curate the data to make sure that you have permissible code that uh, you feed it with for, for training. Because if you have code that you cannot freely use, uh, the, as part of the training data, then you cannot use the output. And if you do, you're going to get sued. So the, you have all these issues with data governance that uh, companies like uh, Microsoft have uh, to deal with. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just to add, I think the, the difference or the hope now where we are is we can use, again, to the, to the earlier topic, the technology to help us address the data problem as well. So having AI help us cleanse, help us structure, help us secure and redefine data is also an accelerator. So, so it's, it's, it's not the serialized traditional version of we need to get data first in order to get value. We can have both. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and I think that you know, when you looked at data governance historically, rewind you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was almost like a point in time. It was like a, a, a security you know, assessment or something where it's like, at this point in time, the data was curated, the data was, was safe, we, we, we re reduced the, the, the risk of, that, of exposing that data, or, or we, we feel confident that the quality of the data is good. Um, and, and now, at the rate that we're generating data, we really have to uh, do that you know, in, in near real time. And, and so, especially with some of the large organizations uh, that, that you guys support, uh, I just think of the the amount of video created for YouTube. Like the, you, you have to be able to analyze that data, you know, in in you know as close to real time as possible, and and just at a size and scale that's that's almost unimaginable. The other thing I find interesting is I think that uh, AI will be the catalyst to to do many of these data governance activities, which will then help uh, unstopper some of the challenges we've had with things like DLP. Uh, you know, it's things like zero trust, where, where you're trying to implement a zero trust framework. Now, the first thing you need to know is, what do I have? And, and if data is an asset and data is, is, is intellectual property, um, and it's a differentiator in how the business is going to operate, um, being able to, to do those DLP projects, being able to, to do a, a good business case and, and forward your, your zero trust architecture, significantly. I, I, think, I think those will be things we'll be able to follow along because AI is, is the you know, the business case that drives value that'll, that'll really get us through some of those, those blockers. Um, so we talked a little bit about democratization of AI. We talked a little bit about uh, access to tools. Um, when, you, when you look at um, the way that having access to tools is sort of changing things for, maybe it's for your teams or maybe it's for um, if, you're, if you're plugged into any of the uh, education institutions and, and how they're helping, you know, teach the, the students that will be, you know, our workers of tomorrow. Um, how is, is uh, democratization of AI, democratization of those tools, how's that really driving, you know, positive change for, for people? So first, uh, democratization of uh, AI really uh, goes two different ways. You have uh, the, the open AI way, which uh, basically provides APIs to people to use, mm -hmm. and obviously they're paid APIs, and you have the open source community that's basically delivering free source and free data for AI scientists to, to build their own models. And actually, OpenAI does both because they, they provide a lot of uh, open source software as well, like OpenAI Triton, which is a kernel compiler. Um, I think open source has helped an awful lot already. I mean, you, you, you have half a million models, uh, most of them language models on Hugging Face. And uh, there are tools available there as well. There is uh, free data available uh, mm -hmm. there as well. And a lot of different organizations have been able to pick those up and build their own application with their own models and specialize them and deploy them. So it really propagated the, the, the AI knowledge that originates from companies like Microsoft and Google and OpenAI mm -hmm. to, to a wider community. Now, they have much smaller model, they have much less data, but still they do uh, really powerful uh, specialized models. That, uh, and, 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 and I think that really contributes to democratizing AI. 
a lot to democratization, the concept at an uh, experience level as well. The ability for, uh, we have a really interesting case of a developer with disabilities working with a co-pilot, developing better code, uh, having removing the interface challenges that this person might have and really creating better software, high quality software. I think th at that level is also very democratizing in many ways. Uh, we also see the, even the, the usage and the experience, the access to the technology and how we can start freeing up and make this accessible to more, more people is really, really, really key as well. So enabling and enhancing productivity, like a very industry use case right now, which is bringing all the mainframes from banking in, in very legacy languages, but the ability to now through an AI assistant, help anyone understand what that code is and what it will look like in a new code. I consider that democratization as well, is really making sure that those experiences are available for every function, every industry, every scenario. And Office Copilot obviously will bring AI assistant to billions of people, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one to bring up because, again, as a as a, a, a really you know general purpose tool, if it saves each of us five percent of our our week, <laughs> that, that, yes. you, you compound that across everybody that's out there. That's a significant you know productivity uh, boost. I always uh, I also look at um, the the ability of of some of these AI assistants to help with education. Okay. Like not everybody is able to afford tutors. Not everybody is able to to uh, have somebody you know, there to, to help mentor their education. And, and I look at that as a big opportunity where um, being able to, to bring you know, some of those uh, very well-described you know, mathematics, STEM, all, all of those types of, of skills and, and education more accessible to you know, maybe lower income or maybe parts of the world that, that it, it's, it's, again, it's tough to get those types of, of teachers you know, local, right? So yeah, I, I think democratization of AI is one of those things that I, you know, I think it's going to be dear to all of us and, and how it, it helps. You know. Education is a great example. I like that because when Wikipedia came out, I was like, oh, man, I wish I had that when I was a kid. <laughs> it's, it's like a library at your fingerprint, mm -hmm. right? And you can read the whole thing. If you have questions, maybe you can figure it out. But now with AI, you can actually interact with that. If you have questions, you just ask and it responds. And of course, sometimes it hallucinates, but you can always ask him, okay, can you provide me your sources about that? Because I'm not quite sure. And 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 the chatbot would tell you, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the sources or, oh, okay, I, I apologize. That was <laughs> ju 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 just a prediction. <laughs> and, and we use we use uh, uh, Bing Chat internally. And, and I love that it started adding uh, cited resources at the end of all of That's those, right. right? Like it's, it's great for research. I, I mean, it's it's a huge departure from having to know the Dewey Decimal System to find the the, the types of books you're looking for. So. Absolutely, and, and education is a, is an interesting topic because this is where I in, invite everyone to to really see the the potential. Because right now we're thinking, oh, ChatGPT is disrupting education. Kids can actually ask for homework, but in reality, is the potential of Every individual student asking for a very specialized education can be done through that technology. The ability to assist a teacher on special needs for their students is also a very democratizing engine for, for everyone. So it's just how do we contextualize the technology? How do we make it available? How do we restrict it in the right context, not give all the answers? Khan Academy is a great example of that with the tutor is, it's not if, if, the, if the student asks, give me the answer to the questions, it actually says, hold on, like, what are you thinking? Give me a little bit of your thinking process. That is really an enhancer in so many levels. So I think the same applies to a lot of the more industries. Yeah, and, and I think there's also an opportunity to get uh, very interesting, access to very interesting specialized education early as well. Like, like, like not everybody grows up necessarily thinking they're going to be a chip designer. Um, but, uh, you know, if you expose kids to those types yes. of, of opportunities, you never know what, what, will, what you'll find really resonates with, with, you know, making somebody feel uh, accomplished and fulfilled. And, and, and so, so I think there's, you know, when, when I look at it and, and we think about, you know, trying to advance, um, you know, more people into like STEM as, as a career path. And, and, and so I, I just see there, there being a lot of opportunity where um, you, can, you can help expose, 
you know, at a, at a younger age, kids to some really interesting ways of learning, some really interesting topics that, that you know, maybe you're in a small community and you just don't have those types of, of mentors and teachers available. But um, right. so, so let's pivot a little bit to, um, you know, how things are accelerating. We talked a little bit about how the, the investments into hardware is accelerating, how we're leveraging the, the, the new tools to, to, to do that. Um, how is artificial intelligence uh, innovating artificial intelligence? And, and so, you know, so let, if we just kind of, like, we, we talked a little bit about this in a couple of different areas, but, but when you think about um, how is AI improving AI and, and where does it stop? I mean, we talked about this cycle, like, like do, do we just continue? Yeah, we talked about the cycle, the virtual cycle of AI improving chip design, that results in hardware that improves AI. Um, the same thing is going for software. I mean, the, the whole AI software stack from the framework all the way down to a internal representation that you can optimize, and then the hardware-specific compilers and optimizers. This whole thing is actually also being improved and, uh, and open-sourced and uh, improved with AI. So software is also being improved uh, by AI, the whole software stack from the framework to the internal representation to the hardware specific optimizers and compiler is being enhanced with AI. We talked about AI improving data curation, but mm -hmm. it's also improving the optimizations that you can do uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the model. And uh, you talked about accelerating uh, I innovation. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you think about it, we're still on, on an exponential improvement of computer systems in general. I mean, Moore's law is more or less dead at the silicon level, but with uh, parallel computing and improvement in algorithms, AI and so on, we are still improving com computing power per watt mm -hmm. exponentially. And when you think of an exponential, it, it, its acceleration is exponential too. And uh, so, so the, the derivative of an exponential is an exponential, <laughs> and the second derivative is an exponential. So not only we're improving exponentially, we're, the, the acceleration is also increasing exponentially, and the acceleration of the acceleration is an exponential too. So we, we, we seem to, to think that... Uh, rate of progress is uh, is accelerating every year but it, it's actually true no on a, on a similar vein i think uh, the this this topic is what excites me the most because we're seeing it from a platform perspective in all possible dimensions so even ai making ai better is one dimension i mean ai making data better is another dimension uh, but I think that the key frontier would be when AI becomes so ubiquitous to the process, it's going to embed in every application in AI, making it smarter, making it better. Uh, that is really where we are seeing the progress. And it's, uh, like you mentioned, exponentially faster, but, uh, but really will feed with each other. Uh, at the beginning, we thought generative AI will be the tip of the spear and it will go uh, by itself. But in reality, it's bringing a lot of the AI technologies like ML and others bringing along the ride because there's specific cases for it. So having intelligent connected apps at all time, bringing us insights, it will be a, such a, 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 a place that we forget about the technology. We're just getting insights in every experience we have and, and then we move forward to the next level of, of technology and innovation. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting how, uh, you know, Technology sometimes starts to to imitate art. We we think about you know I, I'm I'm a science fiction fan. I've always you know grown up with that, and, and it's interesting to see you know some of the work that that you know you are doing, some of the work that, that you're doing with your teams at Microsoft. It's interesting to see some of these things start to come about, right? We both always joke about we still don't have flying cars, but but there's so many <laughs> other things that we're doing. Um, which I agree, that, that's what excites me too, is where things are changing, how rapidly things are changing. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but but I got into IT because uh, I saw that IT was just going to continue to evolve. And I figured mm-hmm. after, you know, three or four or five years of being in IT, I would know as much as anybody else because everything would have completely shifted. And so, I, you know, maybe it's every two years things are going to be changing. You know, point about Moore's Law, I think the, the, the change cycle is accelerating too. Um, so, um, so to kind of close out some of the some of the topics we've been talking about here, I'd like to get a feeling for you know wh- what what excites you about the next phase here. So so if the um, if if the our ability to do compute, if our ability to curate data, create new algorithms, if all of that is going to continue to accelerate, um, what excites you about what we're going to do next? So I think short term, it's uh, what we talked about, the multi-model uh, mm. models that uh, can learn from uh, not just uh, human language, but also videos, uh, text, smell, uh, hearing, uh, and so on. Uh, and that should really uh, give us the technology to do robots that are at least as smart as, as humans. Maybe they're going to start as almost as smart and then get as smart and then get 2x, 10x, 100, a million x, billion x <laughs> smarter. And eventually we will get to a super intelligence that can actually solve problems that we're not able to solve because we, we have a limited brain as humans. Uh, I don't think we can solve everything. We're still talking about 95% of the universe being uh, black matter and dark energy, which we have no idea what it is, right? Uh, a, a century after general relativity, we actually understand 5% of the universe. Uh, AI may be able at some point to solve these things for us. We may not understand it, but at least we may have the solutions and that may result, I'm talking really long term, you and I will not be here anymore, but that may result into space travel and intergalactic travel, which is a technology that we can't even fathom today. And uh, that's really needed if we want uh, humanity to survive in the long term. I wasn't sure if I should introduce like a, a Turing test <laughs> joke or, or <laughs> I should talk about <laughs> uh, Douglas Adams or <laughs> what. But uh, so, so Gerardo, you know, when you think about uh, as we're going forward, like, like what kind of, what, what excites you? What, what do you think is that, that, that thing that we haven't achieved yet, but, but we're, we're getting close that is really interesting? I, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying what excites me the most is we're just getting started. But really for the future for me is, uh, I'll, I'll simplify it in convergence, connectivity, and reasoning. So really convergence is similar to multimodal, bringing all the technologies together. We're seeing a big integration point of all to the point that if AI becomes, as we heard many times, the electricity that is just there, but is really there to help us be better, um, it, it's it's really great to see that connectivity. How do we connect all those experiences? Right now, we have the cloud, we have some level of connectivity, but can we bring this technology everywhere? Mm-hmm. And and then the reasoning is as the reasoning gets better and better. Uh, to your point, we're going to become better humans. Uh, and and probably I didn't add that last one, but what it also gives me a lot of optimism is humans are still central to the whole conversation. Mm-hmm. It has to be right next to humans, in complement of humans, that this technology evolves uh, to become better. Yeah, that's great. And and uh, so I, I just want to say thank you, thank you again for both of you for joining us. You. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for tuning in to the CDW Canada Tech Talks podcast. Uh, we'll see you next time.